Om Asato Ma Sadagamaya Tamaso Maham Jyoti Gamaya Rituhur Mam Amritam Gamaya Avir Ahavir Maedhi Rudra Yate Dakshinam Mukaham Te Namaha Paha Hinnitiam Om, lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness unto light. Lead us from death to immortality and reach us through and through ourselves and evermore protect us from ignorance by thy sweet, compassionate face. <clears throat> so my subject this morning is what is spirituality? And we are all devotees and spiritual aspirants. And as such, our ultimate concern is with the human spirit, as opposed to physical and material things. The spirit is that immaterial part of ourselves which transcends the body and the mind and the senses and which is more interior than our self-image, our persona, our self-concept. It is our very self. The spirit is our self. It is our self-consciousness. It is our essential nature. It's the essence of our being. It is our soul. It is the spark of divinity within us. The spirit, that is our spiritual self, our consciousness, is the subject. It's not the object. And um, in ancient times, there was a philosophy, the Sankhya philosophy, very much very similar to the Vedanta philosophy, and a good introduction. Sankhya just means enumeration. And those ancient philosophers counted and logically sorted everything in the universe into 25 cos uh, cosmic categories. And then in, in order to make it easy for us, they reduced them to two, the subject and the object. Prakriti and Purusha, nature and the soul. Now by nature, so we have two things, two principles. By nature, these philosophers, they're not, well, they're not referring to wilderness areas or national parks. They're referring to the sum total of uh, the physiosphere, the biosphere, the noosphere, the, all that we can imagine that are gross, subtle, and causal aspects of this extra, the macrocosm, and the microcosm. And so pretty much everything is prakriti. That is its nature. We could say it's stuff. It's all just stuff. And over and apart from all this stuff is pure consciousness. And that is our self. That is our spirit, spirit soul. That's our soul. You have a soul. You're a self-conscious being. 
Now, sometimes it's difficult for us to wrap our brains around the idea of our self and the idea of, of consciousness and our soul. And therefore, the Vedantic scriptures give us at least two good analogies, or let's call them similes. Two similes that will help us to understand the essential nature of our consciousness, that is, the spirit within us. The first is, is that consciousness is like light. And uh, if you can visualize, well, in the Panchatashi, it gives the analogy there of the lamp in the theater. And if you can visualize uh, a theater, maybe in ancient times, and people would file into the theater and the stage, and there was the stage, and there was the orchestra, the curtains open, and the play begins. But over, above, the, up above the audience and the players, there is the lamp, there's the light that continues to burn. That's like our consciousness, illumining everything. The light goes down and illumines everything in the music hall, illumines and touches and reveals each and every person uh, in the theater. And it illumines everyone, the, all the actors on the stage, and all the musicians. Everything is enabled by that light. And yet that light is perfectly detached. It doesn't think, it doesn't feel, it doesn't say anything, it doesn't do anything. That is our, the nature of our true self, called the witness. The witness is the light source that illumines everything. It's so all like that. One simile for kind of helping us to grasp our spirituality, that is our spiritual self. A second simile that's helpful to us compares consciousness, tells us that consciousness is unlimited. It's like space. When you think about space, you know that space is, well, as far as you go, there's more space beyond. That is, space is, is there's no limit to space. There's no threshold. It's infinite. Similarly, it is with consciousness. Consciousness is a principle, like being, that is infinite. And so the very strong claim that's made by the Vedanta philosophy is that you are unlimited. You're, you are an infinite being. And when we say infinite, well, we can think of space. It's a very good analogy. We can think of we think of, so we have an open, an open area, we have an open field, and people may come along, and they may bring material, building materials, and they build a whole house, and they go inside in the house, and they go outside, they say, now we're inside, now we're outside. But the space is, remains unchanged. The space is not affected at all. By the, by, can't be cut by the sword can't be wetted by the rain, dried by the wind. It's kind of, it's invulnerable. And because it is infinite, it's one. There's only, there can only be one infinite. Because it's one only without a second. These are the definitions for your true self, for your own consciousness, for the, for the spirituality within you, for your own spirit soul. The spirit within you, that is your true self, is perfectly still, doesn't move, doesn't do anything. 
And so the spirit is perfect stillness. It makes sense. If there's one only without a second, what would move it? There's nothing outside it that would move it or disturb it. It's infinite. Where would it move to? Where would it go? It remains perfectly still. Now you may say, well, this is the description of our true self, that is, our spiritual self, that's given to us in the Vedanta. And you may say, well, that sounds good. That is, we can't help but have kind of an affirmational response to this teaching. But on the other hand, we have to admit to ourselves that we don't feel like we are the light that illumines this universe. We don't feel like we're infinite and unlimited. We certainly don't feel as if we are invulnerable to the sword or the wind or the rain. And our minds are not perfectly still. And so it seems like there's kind of a, uh, well, and it's true. Vedanta philosophers, well, of course, why is, that the, why is that the case? That's because we're alienated from our true selves. We're distanced from ourselves. We are strangers to ourselves. And so, yes, it often seems as if our higher self, so described in high philosophy, is quite different from our lower self. It's almost as if we have two selves. And if we want to understand what is spirituality, maybe the best way that we can do it is to recall an old allegory that's given to us in the Shweta Shottara Upanishad, also in the Mundaka Upanishad in chapter 5, about the spirit bird. Now in this allegory, now an allegory you know is not a, it's not a simile, it's not, a, it's not an analogy, it's not a metaphor, it's more like a story. And so here we have, we're going to have a little story that's like, it has a setting, it has some characters, it has a situation, complication, and crisis, and the whole den denouement. It's a story of our life and of our condition. Visualize, for example, a, a great forest. And uh, in the forest, with all those mighty trees everywhere, maybe a gentle breeze is blowing. And there we can single out, there's one tree. We look more closely at that tree, and we can see that there are two birds perched on the self-same tree. The one bird is on the lower branch, one is on the lowest branch, and it's hopping around, it's very busy, it's eating the sweet and the bitter fruits. And the second bird, and they look both the same, but the second bird is perched on the highest branch. Is seated quietly, majestically, the witness of the whole forest, looks on without eating. So meanwhile, this lower bird is hopping around, gets a sweet fruit, enjoys it, then gets another, gets a bitter fruit, and is very disgusted, and is disappointed, stops and hesitates for a moment, and then ch be chances to look up. And there he sees that higher bird, not suffering from any disappointment, uh, on that higher branch, thinking, yes, that's an odd, I wish I was like that. Maybe he jumps up one branch, but then he gets distracted again. Eating the sweet fruits, eating the bitter fruits. He gets a particularly bitter fruit, and uh, feels disgusted, stops, begins to do some introspection, then looks up, sees that higher bird, gets inspired, jumps up one branch, 
gets distracted again. And so like this, time passes. And little by little, he's hopping up the branches. And then uh, when he gets very near the top, an amazing thing happens. That is, he looks up, he sees that higher bird, and then he just takes one jump up, and he merges into that higher bird. And in fact, we see that really there was only one bird all along. You know how in a forest, sometimes the, the breeze is blowing and the leaves are, they're, they're, the sun is shining and we have reflections in the leaves of the trees and oftentimes there are illusions in those leaves. And so here on this tree, there was an illusion of two birds but really there was only one bird all along. And that's the spirit bird. That is our own true self. So this is the allegory in the Upanishads that, um, well, let's look more closely at the symbolism of this allegory. The lower bird is our everyday walking around conscious self. That is to say, it's the natural man. It's, the, um, it's our conventional self. It's our phenomenal ego. It's the person that we usually, that we think of as our self. We are the jivatma. Sanskrit that means the embodied self. We're embodied. We are subject to spiritual ignorance. And hence, we've forgotten our true nature and we identify with our physical flesh and blood body, which is made of the five elements. And under the influence of avidya, we are identified with the mind, with the four faculties, and with the ego. And our life goal, pretty much, is um, to find happiness. And by happiness, of course, what we mean, what we mean by happiness is sense pleasure and ego gratification. This is why happiness is not the goal of life in Vedanta. The goal of life is self-knowledge understanding your true nature. It's not the um, pursuit of happy, happiness and, and, uh, and pleasure. But this is the ordinary, this is Jivatma. This is the lower bird. He's in pursuit of this goal. He seeks out the sweet action. That's a karmic act, karmic act of karma. Leaves an impression and they propel our other, our, our, our next actions. And we get caught in what Dr. Sigmund Freud called a repetition compulsion. And we find ourselves locked into these endless cycles, vicious cycles of karma. And hence we find those are like little, those are like links in a chain. That means we're bound. That's why we're bound. Because everything we do is impelled and compelled by desire and leaves an impression and reinforces our bondage. And as long as we live in pursuit of happiness, um, then that will be our condition. And we're born and we live our lives and we die and then we're born again. And so it goes on in life after life and uh, round and round we go in the great wheel of reincarnation. And we live in this world of suffering called samsara. That's the lower bird. 
Now let's look here at the symbolism of the higher bird. The higher bird is your true self. The higher bird is when you realized your true nature. You become the light of lights. You become infinite. One realized that you are one only without a second. And then uh, the enlightened sage lives in the world as the witness of the sattvic mind. That means after enlightenment, if, he, if the mind comes down to the lower plane of this world, relative world, then the enlightened person lives as the witness. That is, he has, he, he has a discrimination between the real and the unreal and renunciation. And he, has, uh, em, he is the embodiment of all spiritual qualities and spiritual virtues. This is the nature of the saint, the sage, the mystic, the hero. He is the embodiment of all these spiritual virtues. He sees God, he has realized God within himself. He sees God in everything. And um, as a result of which, he feels within himself, hap all happiness is within, his joy is within, his light is within. He sees that light in all beings, and he regards all beings with, with great uh, um, altruism and compassion. So this is the higher bird. And the two birds on the tree, well, our subject this morning here is what is spirituality? Now let's look here at this word spirituality. Spirituality is a very abstract word. It's an itty word. Morality, uh, identity, religiosity, uh, reality. <laughs> These are all, uh, uh, so, we're trying, our ideal it is to embrace our, these, these abstract terms, that is our spirituality, our divinity. Spirituality just means divinity. Divinity just means light. The word, that's the, that's the etymology of the word. It means the shining being. So when talking about your spirituality, it's talking about the divinity within you, within you that is yourself, that is your spirit, your spirit soul. And the goal of spiritual life is to embrace the divinity within us. That is to say, it's the, what is spirituality? It's just the process of hopping up the tree. And the goal, what's the goal of the lower bird? The goal here is to realize our true nature. The goal of all things in the universe is to be what it, all, what it really is. That's our goal. Our goal is to be who we really are. Who we really are is our true self. Our goal in life, therefore, is to become one with our true self. The lower bird becomes one with the higher bird. Swami Vivekananda says, each soul is potentially divine. The goal is to manifest this divinity within us. Divinity here means spirituality. Our reality, our authenticity. Um, our goal is to manifest our spirituality within by controlling nature. And by that he's referring here to different forms of yoga sadhana, that is, spiritual practices. And the spiritual practices just means the things that we do to hop up the tree. There's different things that we can do. Each, anything that we do that enables us to move closer and become one with our true nature is a form of yoga. That is, yoga is just the right way. It's the right way to realize our true nature. And as we do so, that we find 
that our spirituality, that is our awareness, our, our true nature, becomes more man and more manifest. That as a bird, just think of the bird, as he, as he moves up the tree, he's out near the top, they're nearer to the center line, horizontally inward towards his true center. And um, as he continues up the tree, this is the analogy. The analogy is a spatial, vertical analogy. Our goal in life is to go up. It's not to go down. It's to go up. And therefore, our movement is an upward movement. As we move up, we begin to um, grow more and more in detachment. That means they begin to leave as we climb up the branches. The fruit, fruit, the sweet and bitter fruits on the lower branches become less and less attractive. It's as we mature, we're no longer interested in the toys of our childhood, and so by just by a natural process of maturing, we become gradually begin to grow in detachment. This is our spirituality. It's becoming more manifest. Our spirituality becomes more manifest as we do yoga, as we do spiritual practice. And as we do so, we rise up above the conflicts of our mind and our heart and the world. And that's what causes our mental disturbance and our unhappiness is all conflict. But as we move higher, we find that the conflicts of the lower are resolved. And uh, we gain perspective. We gain objectivity. They no longer, they're no longer, we no longer find uh, disharmony and conflict in the, between, between ourselves and others and between inner conflict within ourselves. And as our spirituality increases, we begin modulating up the branches. That means to higher and higher levels of, of vibration. We could say in, uh, in, into, into a higher, uh, going from zero to a thousand or so, we're more, we're mo we all the spiritual emotions and feelings that we have can all be mapped onto a, onto a spectrum. And when we get about five or six hundred, then we begin to manifest spiritual emotions and begin to, just as we're in the atmosphere, you go up to more and more rarefied and refined um, vibrational fields. That's, our, that's, our, uh, that's the process of spiritual life. So this is the, how spirituality grows. By the way, you don't have to, you think so, it sounds like a lot of work. But really speaking, I mean, philosophically, it's no work at all because your, your, that is your higher self, your true self, is kind of like, it's like a helium balloon. And it's all tied down. You see these big balloons. And they're all tied down, maybe, to the ground. Somebody gets in the basket and they're going to go on a, they're going to go around the world. And they get, then they have to loosen those ropes. They cast off the ropes that are tying, binding them down. Eh, the balloon just goes up by itself. So let's look here at our question. Our question here is, what is spirituality? Sometimes it's helpful when we're trying to grasp and understand an abstract uh, conceptions. It's helpful for us to look at the contrasting words. And sometimes in contrast, we become more clear about the nature of our, um, what we're trying to understand. So we have two words. Let's look at two words. We'll look at two pairs of contrasting pairs. That is to say, words that, uh, that really refer to different concepts, and yet they're often used, they're, and, and yet they're, they're, but they're contrasting. They're opposites. Now let's look at two words. Spirituality and worldliness. These are two words that are opposites. Now, worldliness, 
Worldliness is a word that um, you will read a lot about in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. And it's an interesting word to us from as students of, uh, in just in common parlance, the word worldly in ordinary uh, common language, a worldly man, would be is it just a man who's cosmopolitan, who knows his way around. That's a positive kind of description. But in Vedanta, that is to say, in religious language, a lot of these words are going to be, have their own definition. So in religious language, worldly, the worldly man is a person who is, is defined, his, his, that is, his consciousness is externalized. He's sense-bound. He's earth-bound. A worldly man is materialistic, is atheistic. His whole consciousness is characterized by what Sri Ramakrishna says, me and mine. Uh, lust and greed. These are his controlling attitudes, his controlling passions. And the worldly person is a person who was read in the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, is preoccupied with sense pleasure, with ego gratification, with satisfying the, the, the compulsive needs of the lower chakras, and who lives his life kind of like a fly, flying around, uh, landing sometimes on sweet flowers, but sometimes on filth, indiscriminate lives life without the first, the first prerequisite for spiritual life, discrimination. Lacking in discrimination. We can compare this worldly man with the other worldly man. That is the devotee, the spiritual person. Spiritual person is more like a, a, a bee. A bee just flies all around, lands only on sweet, fragrant flowers. And that's all. That is, a bee had, has, has discrimination. So the other worldly man, that is the, the true devotee, his mind is fixed on higher things. His mind is preoccupied with soul, God, and religion. And... And worldly, spirituality and worldliness. Let's look at another contrasting pair that'll help us to understand what is spirituality. And that is two words, religion and spirituality. Now by religion, what we usually mean, we think of the great religions of the world, and by religion in common parlance, just means one of the an organized big cultural institution that maybe has a, has a church building and a synagogue and a, a tabernacle. And you have a whole body of true believers who will meet in that church on a Sunday morning. And they all share a common worldview. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a social unit. That is, they do, they do, may do congregational singing and um, may, do, may do collective um, prayer. And the goal, that is to say, the, the moral ideal of such a religious person is just to be good and to do good. And to attain, maybe as a life goal, to attain salvation through faith and good works. Now we can contrast, contrast that idea of a religious person, a religion with spirituality. That is, you don't have to belong to a church 
or do any kind of uh, congregational singing in order to be spiritual. You don't have to believe in God or do good works in order to be spiritual. Spirituality is all about your pers it's, it's, a very, it's a personal, individual thing about your relationship with God or with your higher true self. The goal and purpose of a spiritual person, now remember we're using here, we're talking here about reli religious language. Spiritual person is a person whose goal is to become a saint, become a sage, to realize their true self, to a, to a chain of liberation, and to do so, how? By spiritual practice. By actually, what a spiritual person is interested in a direct, immediate, personal experience of God. And it's all, it's a very um, individual matter. So, the two contrasting pairs. Now, our subject this morning is what is spirituality? Let's look more closely at um, three pairs of confusables. By confusables here, I mean words that are, uh, refer to different things, but which are often confused and used synonymously. And if we can discriminate between them, it'll help us to give a clearer idea of what is spirituality. Now, uh, and spirituality. Let's count religion and spirituality as one of those pairs of uh, a little bit and think pair that more aligns, uh, getting my order here, if I can think about the uh, contrasting two, two things, we talk about spiritual and spirituality and worldliness, we could also see that in Christian mysticism, that mystic, the, 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 the life of the saints and the sages, they say, is often who, uh, that we have three enemies. They say in Christian mysticism, we have three enemies in spiritual life. And that is the world, the flesh, and the devil. And uh, spirituality is often characterized as a, as a battle, as a warfare between the spirit and the flesh. And St. Paul, now by, the, by, the, by the, what he means by the flesh, it's not the flesh and blood body, but it's all those desires that, come to, that arise in our mind from an ungodly place. That is from our lower mind. We have a lower mind, and our lower mind is often kind of like our friend. Well, here it's often characterized as warfare. It's not that it's the enemy. The lower mind is our enemy, but actually, maybe it is. Because in the Bhagavad Gita, you know, Sri Krishna says that our mind is our own best friend and our own worst enemy. But let's not think of our mind as an enemy. Let's think of our mind, our lower mind, as being like an a, a, a unruly, misbehaving, naughty child. And that in my lower mind has got to be controlled. And what does a child need? Well, he's not evil, but he needs to be controlled. He needs structure. He needs discipline. And so we have the conflict between the, the, the wisdom of the parents, that is the spirit and the flesh. And this is the vision here of the, the desert fathers in ancient Egypt. You remember how they're there, they, their ideal was to live like, a, like an angel, to live, to walk in the spirit, to control their lower nature. Angels don't eat, they don't sleep, and uh, they just spend their nights in prayer and austerity. That was their ideal. That's a spiritual ideal. And so we can contrast the two, the spirit and the flesh. So then we had, so we have these different, we have these different word pairs. Now we have, the, we, have the, we have the contrasting pairs. We have the confusable pairs, that is religion and, and spirituality. Let's look at another uh, pair, confusable pair. Discriminating, if we can discriminate them, it'll help us to clarify in our mind what is spirituality. And that is the difference between morality and spirituality. Now when we say morality, what do we mean? We mean by morality. In common parlance, 
we just mean the uh, um, morality is that which is the ultimate good. Doing the good, knowing what is good, and doing the right thing. And a moral person, we can generally speaking, as the words commonly used, a moral person is a person who has managed to avoid the seven deadly sins and who adheres to the Ten Commandments. And if, you, if, if that's the case in your life, if you pretty much have, have adhering to those commandments, and if you don't have any kind of a, maybe a, a police record, you're considered to be a moral person. You're considered to be a moral, upstanding citizen. But we know, too, that morality, moralism, is not spirituality. And we have to discriminate. It's not enough to be, in, in, in order to become spiritual, it's not enough to be moral. It's not enough to be good. It's not enough to do good. You have to, you have to be godly. You have to, now you have to do good, you have to do karma yoga. You have to, um, this is what it means to be, to become spiritual, to do spiritual practice, to do yoga sadhana. But that's what the, that's, we could define spirituality really as yoga, that is as spiritual practice, and as orienting our lives to doing spiritual practice. These spiritual practices, morality and spirituality, are kind of, they go together. They're both on the line of renunciation. Everybody has to renounce. But there's a line, first moral, then spiritual. The morality, we have, they go together. First comes, it's just like the bud and the, and the blo blooming and blossoming of a flower. First comes the bud, then comes the flower. The both go together. You can't, and you can't have the, uh, we can't have the spirituality without the morality to form the basis, the basis. So similarly, these two go together. It's like, mo it's like the, uh, um, um, religion and spirituality also. They're, not, they're, 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 they're very similar words, and yet they're kind of, we can imagine, concentric circles, that really the spirituality is like the interior circle, often compared with like a pearl in the oyster. The oyster is just kind of the exoteric part, and the interior part is the spirituality. So, like this, we have these confusables. We have, the, we have uh, religion, spirituality. We have morality and spirituality. And the last one, let me discriminate between n New Age spirituality and Vedanta spirituality. Now, the New Age, speaking to you, those of you who are older and wiser, the New Age uh, was, a, that is to say, was part of the counterculture movement in America, 1960s, later on. And the New Agers visualized a whole, um, a new world, an urgence of a new world, of, of, uh, of elevated and enlightened spiritual consciousness, and uh, envisioned a world in which everyone lived together in peace and in harmony with each other and with nature. And uh, this New Age spirituality was often defined by historians as psycho-spirituality. And by that they mean is, is that all of the disciplines of the, of the of personal growth, the human potential movement, and psychological growth was merged with, with the embracing of spiritual traditions of all the different religions. And so we got kind of a, a, a very pluralistic and uh, inclusive ideal of many forms of personal growth and spiritual practice. But New Age spirituality is pluralistic, but it's also eclectic. It celebrates diversity, but it has no unity. 
It is lacking, in, it has no philosophy. This is why the Vedanta in Vedanta, Vedanta is also a philosophy and a pluralistic. That is, it is also a worldview that embraces all manners of personal growth and all manners of uh, forms of religion and spiritual practice. But it does so um, by, by finding unity in diversity, by identifying fundamental principles and hierarchy that unify and organize the whole, the, the map, the global map, as it were, and, um, and therefore give us, gives us a, 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 um, a vision of seeing the one in the many, seeing God in everything. So that we're good for us to distinguish here between Vedantic, uh, what mean by mean here by spirituality, and uh, I would suggest that maybe it is that the Vedanta philosophy and yoga psychology gives us the most comprehensive understanding of the answer to our question this morning, and that is what is spirituality. Here. Three announcements, not a lot. We've got Swami Sarva Priyananda will speak on Friday um, at the temple. And his subject, what is that, five o'clock? Yeah, five o'clock. His subject is emptiness. <laughs> and if you don't like that topic, then you can come on Saturday night. <laughs> Swami Sarva Priyananda will speak eloquently on the subject of fullness. <laughs> so those will be um, good Vedanta lectures. And then on Sunday, Swami Medhananda has an interesting topic, and that is, um, that topic is mindfulness with the Vedantic twist. Om. Oh, 
Om Dyo Ho Shantihi Antariksha Ham Shantihi Priti Vi Hi Shantihi Apa Shantihi O Shadaya Shantihi Vanas Pataya Shantihi Vishwe Deva Shantihi Brahma Shantihi Saravam Shantihi Shanti Reva Shanti Sa Me Shanti Rehi Om Shanti 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 Om Peace is in heaven, peace is on the earth, peace is in the sky and in the waters, the herbs and plants and trees are full of peace. The gods are peaceful. May this eternal universal peace enter our souls and beings. Om. Peace, peace, peace be unto us all.